Recording is on. I, I'm not a big fan of the blue particle and all the proto particle and all that kind of stuff. Like, nah, and I don't like alien creatures that do weird things. But everything else about the expanse, I, I really, really loved, including the the weird character with the fedora who comes in and comes out, and you know <laughs> all those things. Like, cool. the thing I, I really love that it's a space thing, and they do real physics. And then there's this Lantian. There's this weird thing where they also like totally ignore some stuff, like the amount of time it gets to places, it takes to get to places. Yeah. Or the difference, one of the weirdest ones is the difference between velocity and acceleration. <clears throat> they kind of pretend that acceleration is velocity and you know, it's like, you know, we're burning at one G, we're burning at three Gs. And it's like, if you're burning at three Gs, you're going faster and faster and faster and faster. You're not just going as, you know, it's not like a car. <laughs> <laughs> I do think they, I thought they did actually take that hook out when they're talking about the timelines. They're assuming accelerating halfway there and decelerating halfway. When they do travel, they're doing that. Yeah, they do that. But then the the effects on on the body or something like that. It's like we have to get someplace really fast. So it's like, well, do a short burn and then you know, and then you're going fast, you know. But they burn the whole way instead of like just a short burn. Uh, uh huh. And they also sort of jack in and put like fluids in their body when they do the super yeah. fast burns. And yeah, stuff like that. but I, I thought the burn was still like a, a justify because I guess if you want to go as fast as possible, you will burn half the way, no? And I if think they want to go as fast as possible, but there are times when they, they it's, it's like they don't want to go as fast as possible. They want to go fast. So because, and, and they want to make it hard, right? They want to make it hard to go fast, I guess, is, is the thing. So it's like, you see the undersecretary, you know, she's like, uh, you know, and it's like, dude, you're already going really fast. You know? <laughs> so in my brain, there's a thought titled, uh, a big inspiration for OGM is to build the Epstein drive for civilization's memory and decisions. And, and now I know what that means. I've heard that a bunch of times before. But... Sorry to start off with oh. that. Line. Don't, you know, starting off with the, the expanse is a great thing. The expanse is beautiful, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if this uh, is hold like on, I have to story. stop a room service. Oh, yeah. ah, cool. Ah, traveling. Uh, it, when it, when it, uh, I, now it's over, right? Um, uh, then we have all this innovation in, you know, DALI, uh, stable diffusion, all this. Yep. Uh, and of course, we are trending towards video generation, and there's so many early experiments. And I'm like, you know what, this will like uh, have many downsides, but if we can get like an infinite uh, expanse episode generator, I will totally <laughs> totally worth that. it. Just... Yeah, I've, I've thought kind of the same thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, enjoy that a lot. And uh, I really like the the interface they use. Very tiny on the arms, like a lot of those, but you know, like pushing and... Yeah. Yes, pull and push in the Agora are sort of inspired by that. Yeah. Just like yeah. that small, yeah. And wait, what was the thing that was the inspiration that I missed? Uh, you know, when they, they, they have this, uh, you know, they actually can send data to each other. The, the UI is for, yep. They slide it more, but, uh, and also like, you know, they have this uh, holographic more things which they are, they, they are like, oh, I'm yeah. done with this or actually bring it bring it in. And so several of you know this already, but I, through the course of the last couple of months, I've sort of made friends with John Underkoffler who is the guy who created the G-Speak interface, which is the interface that Tom Cruise uses to search for pre for pre-crime, which is actually a functional user interface that lets you do things exactly like that. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. It's a multi-user interface where you can throw things to each other's screens. You can then manipulate them with gestures and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, oh, nice. Super interesting. What, what, what is the name? G-Speak. I will send the, I will add a link. Thank you. Oh. This should do it. There. Awesome. And his company Oblong got bought and sort of along with it, uh, the rights to all that kind of stuff. But, uh, um, but anyway, it's still out there. And he's been on a couple of the podcast episodes that I've been recording for Betaworks. Uh, in fact, my, yeah. my favorite. How is that? I yeah, it's going really well. My favorite of the episodes is up right now only on Spotify, but I'll share that link because it's a it's a really I think it's an episode everybody here would really like. 
Um, it should be, I'm a big fan of YouTube over all those things, as you know, but, but here it is on Spotify uh, and we're doing video and audio only broadcasts. Uh, and this Spotify one actually has the video embedded somehow. I don't know exactly how all that works since I'm not familiar with all of the exit avenues anymore. Um, but it's quite cool. Cool. Yeah. Looking forward. I mean, want to catch up. I haven't. What's up with you? Que tal? Report in. <laughs> yeah, we can do chicken. Yeah, yeah, makes yeah. sense. Uh, let me, I just uh, come in. Yeah, I'm taking notes. I'll, I'll... Yeah, so I, I've been a bit all over the place. So let's do chickens. Yes, uh, just like this. Uh, we're, run, we're, we're almost hitting the limit of nodes, uh, the node length in Fellowship of the Link. So it, it, it feels a bit like uh, exciting to type. It's like, I'm going to get the, I'm gonna get an error. Uh, it's easy to fix it. Um, yeah, so um, I've been spread thin, you know, when you feel spread thin, uh, but that's improving. So I'm happy about that. Yes. Um, and this some, uh, uh, do, do they call it adulting? Adulting. Uh, it's hard. I don't like adulting. Yeah. No, it's like very hard. And then there, and there, yes. Uh, so yeah, tax return. And I did my tax return yesterday and all these things. But before I actually delivered like a draft should be readable at least until uh, around 50% of it of the uh, Agora uh, related chapter for this book uh, after editor. Yeah, so yeah, I will get some more feedback probably, but I, I think it's getting somewhere. Somewhere, I don't know if good or bad, but somewhere. Uh, and um, yes, I guess uh, I, um, I've been like also like quite involved in social co-op, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cool. with the Elon Musk um uh, like uh exodus mm -hmm. the fediverse is very exciting the musk apocalypse, right the musk apocalypse. <laughs> yes and like uh which you know it's like uh, uh we we also have like a more constructive frame uh, apocalypse well you know i guess i don't know enough what comes after apocalypse in uh in the bible but <laughs> mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah so uh, so a lot of uh, movement there and like interesting opportunities i think when it comes to perhaps, um, I guess, exploring a bit more what a, um, a coordination point uh, looks like for the failures uh, on top of what we already have. Uh, because, you know, like to some extent, you know, uh, we're getting, it's like an amazing uh, stress test for the failures in many ways, you know, like instances are having issues with load and so on. But also it's like a lot of people just like, even with people with intentions to like get out of Twitter, they don't do it. They, they fall through the cracks. So thinking about the sign up flow and, you know, uh, and whether we could do anything, you know, perhaps like a non greedy entity that could say you want, I think, I don't know if this was brought up uh, this here by Chris last time, you know, like, or, or, or whether I read it, uh, perhaps you want, you know, this is the username I want. And then this router will say, oh, well, these are all the instances that have this username available. And this is their trait, you know, their, their traits. So like sort of like flipping the sign up a bit on, on its head. Um, yeah, so some discussion on that and uh, on the cop side uh, and uh, some other work. But, uh, you know, less than I would like, but, you know. How much of your chapter for the book is actually Agora artifacts and is agorified? Right. So it started as fully on the Agora, and there's still a draft there. Right now, we move to Google Docs for the review flow. But the idea is still to sync back to Markdown, Markdown awesome. Plus Wikileaks. Fabulous. So okay. I'm actually using Agora, you know, what I call Agora protocol, perhaps in an exercise of uh, overreach, <laughs> which is like outlines plus an intention, semantic intention. Uh, yes, so the, it's going to be fully synced. And I actually would like to perhaps have like a, a, an Agora setup just with the chapter of the book, just to see how they work in, 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 in context, I guess. And that sync back uh, yeah. to Markdown, is that just your intention or is that everybody who wrote a chapter's intention? Everybody, yeah, because the, the editors want that actually. Awesome. Yeah, Love yeah, that. yeah, it's nice. That's great. And the, the draft you want to see is go about a, a chapter. Uh, yes, that's in docs. And yeah, so I guess uh, a bit over the place, but things are starting to like sort of like converge towards like perhaps the end of the year and next year, you know, I will, uh, I, I will try to perhaps have fewer focuses, so more focus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And what about you? Uh, what, what are you up, uh, up to? 
Um, I'll check in, then we can keep going. So I'm right now in near Tahoe at what the place, the place formerly known as Squaw Creek, but at a resort that still calls itself the Squaw Creek Resort. So uh, it is uh, snowy outside with evergreens. I'm here because the Linux Foundation is having its member summit this week. And yesterday, April, uh, she was uh, basically contracted with a month ago to give a keynote speech, which she gave yesterday. Uh, then when she when she got that gig, she wrote Brian Billendorf and said, hey, Brian, did you have anything to do with uh, my getting this gig? And he says, no, didn't even know about it. But is Jerry coming? And he's, she's like, no, you know, no plan for him to come. And so Brian says, oh, he, he should totally come and he should be my guest. So he did that. And then I'm also going to help Brian facilitate a, a meeting on Friday. So I'm actually staying longer. April flew home today, uh, but I'm staying longer. And lots of really interesting things. I'll tell two short stories. Uh, one is yesterday I'm standing talking to a guy named Remy who works for uh, Medicaid and Medicare IT, uh, doing open sourcey stuff. And I ask him a question about Tom Manneke and Vista. And, and he's like, ah, I don't know the guy. I should, I should meet this guy. And then a, a tall gentleman with a little bit of a gray beard walks up smiling and shakes Remy's hand and says, it's like, you know, old, old friends meeting and proceeds to answer my question in full detail. Jim St. Clair, and he is dead in the middle of this and completely knows Manneke and Vista and the whole, the whole backstory proceeds to tell me that under Trump, there was a no-bid contract given to Cerner. There's basically a duopoly for hospital information systems between Epic and Cerner. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a no-bid contract given to Cerner for $12 billion to, to, to gut and replace the Vista system that, that Tom Monarchy helped design way back 30 years ago, I think, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which everybody knows is not going to work, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then he goes into detail and then he tells me about open air, open EHR, which is an open source project to do electronic health records, which is the thing that maybe, maybe ought to be done instead. That would be like the cleaner path, which, and there's no clean migration from Vista to open air, but that's, that's like what he would think would be the, the, the better way to go. Cause that's kind of what I was asking him. So anyway, I was marveling at the serendipity of my asking an arcane question of one person. And then the answer just walking up, walking up as I asked the question. So that was just beautiful. <laughs> and then this morning over breakfast, I sat next to a guy. Uh, I sat next to two people, one of whom I met yesterday, who I barely know, who's part of the, a new person two weeks into the Linux Foundation. And he's talking to a fellow who's Chinese who works for FutureWay. Uh, I'll put a link in, in the chat. And, and FutureWay is what it may sound like. It's the, uh, it's the US Futures Lab arm of Huawei. Here's the link. And mm -hmm. Huawei is in all sorts of hot water about uh, possibly being a suspect provider of, of whatever, but they're big supporters of open source. It turns out that Huawei has had to not, and, and I don't know if it's a fork, but they have something called Open Harmony that I haven't gone and looked at yet. Um, but they've basically been forced to build their own infrastructure because Huawei was cut away from the Google infrastructure and other sorts of things. So they're busy using some mixture of open source and proprietary to go build out their own things. And there was a very interesting conversation that I'd never thought about, about how do you bridge, how do you bridge open source projects across dangerous, difficult political boundaries? And maybe there's a follow on question of, can the open source communities be a diplomatic arena for improving relations between political parties that are not happy with each other? because of open source and because of the way open source works and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of, we just barely cracked mm -hmm. open that conversation this morning and then a couple other people arrived at this little table. And so we went in different directions, but I was just, my, my brain was like, oh my God, that's, that's like really interesting to me. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, essentially the potential of open source to build bridges, no? Yeah. And so this, so I'm at the Linux uh, annual member summit, which is really where they're, I'm, blown away by the number of open source projects that Linux Foundation is stewarding or hosting. Like, genuinely impressive. Uh, I, I, and and uh, Jim Zemlin is the, the, the director and he's been the director for like 19 years or something crazy like that in our world. Um, and it seems like he's done a great job because he did the, he did the kickoff talk yesterday morning and, and he was like, and here's an update on what we're up to. And you're like, wait, what? That too? No way. That? This? Really? Looked really cool. 
Um, and then separately, I'm I'm trying to articulate better what I call the relate project, which is like how to stand up a shared memory. Like what what institutions or mechanisms would it take to actually get done what OGM is trying to do and what some of the rest of us are trying to do. Um, so any and all advice on that, are extremely welcome. I should have a I should have a drafty version of something like it uh, in the next uh, few days. That's that's my next goal. Nice. Uh, so um, you said a uh, use the term you said X memory. Collective memory? Uh, shared memory. Shared memory, yes. Yep. Very nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that seems very, uh, I, I would love to read that. Yes. And like, actually, one of my goals is to actually make more time to read because it's, uh, the last six months have felt like a desert uh, a bit in that, in that sense. And I should, I, we should trade places because I have 100 tabs that, that I try to make my way through reading. And what I need to do is write. I need to, you know, t I need to step into the, the, the seat that you were occupying all this time yeah. getting your chapter written well I, i'm also procrastinate and think of like what i'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, do. i don't do anything like that <laughs> yeah anyway uh bentley pete you want to check in you're muted peter I'm thanks well. i got to mute before bentley um uh, i have a comment not a check-in so maybe i should do a check-in later but um the after reading Cory Doctorow's uh, uh, recent post about macroeconomics, the end of the road to serfdom, um, he talks about intellectual property, essentially, um, and property rights and things like that. And it's, it's interesting now looking at how the US has tried to keep um, technology stuff out of China's graphs and so Huawei got, you know, can't, can't use Android as much as it wants to. Exactly. Um, but that's actually kind of an artifact of uh, economic warfare, <laughs> not necessarily fairness. Um, in, in that essay, uh, Corey says, what happens is when you're an up and coming nation, you steal IP. And when you're uh, an established nation, you suppress, you know, you, you, you declare all of, all of IP is mine and I can rent it to you. I'd be happy to rent it to you, but you can't have it, right? So it's interesting having a new lens on, on the China, Android, open source, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also um, really interesting, like the story of um, Benjamin Franklin, among many others, because Franklin made a living as a printer in Philadelphia, basically printing things that were British public, British books with paying no royalties or anything like that. And the British authors were like really pissed at the American publishers because printers, because they were, you know, they were getting no benefit at all from having their works reprinted here. So that was one of many forms of piracy that we were engaging in. Nice. And the, the history of chocolates on this front is really cool also with the Swiss confectioners IP being stolen by British confectioners who were Quakers, who then in the early industrial revolution set up fries, Cadbury's and Roundtree were all Quakers who basically borrowed the fondant method from, from Switzerland and went and made chocolate companies in, in the UK. The history of IP is so fun. Yes, and perhaps we can end it. Yeah. <laughs> or like shape it. No, I mean, I don't know, but like I, I keep thinking, I, I guess copyright is one of my favorite things to rail against. I, I usually, I, I full disclosure, like I, I try not to feel rage, or like anger in, you know, in, this, uh, in these ways, except against these concepts <laughs> or corporations sometimes, like meta. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, like this is my uh, one of my guilty pleasures, and like just copyright is like this kind of thing where like I I, I guess this is maybe I, I don't know if I'm preaching to the choir. I'm interested in, in knowing it, whether we all uh, align on this. It's like it's uh, I think it's the kind of thing where I when I ask around like does anyone think the copyright law makes sense as it is now? I never found anybody who said yes, and uh, and I think that's an experience that many of, of us have. You know, I guess it is. The, the, this this approach may go back to civil disobedience. I guess approach uh, in the sense of like question these laws and like uh, like try to find someone that can defend them who is not in a position of power. I mean, it's because you're not talking to people at the major copyright industries who are all in favor of this, right? I mean, and that's the only people I think. Well, not the only people, uh, but 
that's where it is. Hey, Chris. Hey. Sorry, my 10 o'clock ran long, and then for some reason, Jitsi would not let me join at all. So, oh, that sucks. Oh, right. Glad you're here. We may get access to um, uh, a, a private Jitsi instance uh, okay. soon, and that may solve some issues, including the recording, probably. Yeah, I'll, I'll remind everybody that I can only record the first hour. It doesn't work when I try to keep going. And maybe if someone else tries recording at the hour and we meld those, that would work. But it doesn't work when I try to start it again. So, so one, so yeah, so copyright anyway. It's like a, I don't know if it's worth. The, I mean, I, I, I think it's related to what we, uh, many things we discuss here, right? Because to some extent. I think of, uh, of 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 the wider field of what we are in as the commons, the knowledge commons. No, it's like I guess one of the framings. I know it is everybody. We all align with with that, but like I guess uh, we can translate. But something like a knowledge commons and copyright and intellectual property will be the way to enclose it. No, like so the worst case will be what like we we develop together. The people develop together something really unique and new and beautiful, and then it's co-opted. Uh, that would be like probably like the, one of the worst cases, a, fail, a failure mode we need to protect against, no? Well, it's one of the interesting things happening to Mastodon right now, right? Is that like Mastodon objects to the far right using Mastodon instances, and there's a fork of Mastodon uh, under so tr Truth Social and Gab both. They both were like, oh, cool, open source software, because our software sucked. And, and so the answer is you have to let them use it, but you can't, you don't bridge to them, so you don't replicate their messaging out of the network. Which is interesting. I think that's a. It feels to me like a sort of a reasonable compromise in a weird way. Completely yes, yes, and you know, in the copyright, uh, this is one of the things where, like, I'm. I mean, my approach is very naive, right? I, I don't talk to enough IP attorneys for sure. I don't get um, go out, out of my way to do that. But so, I, and I do surround myself with like you know people, uh, you know, like we all do. I guess it's, uh, we are mostly aligned, I guess. But like, it, to me, it will be like well. It, Perhaps everybody should be able to, to choose their own copyright, right? And groups that uh, define copyright in similar ways mm -hmm. are federating, right? Uh, like intellectual, uh, like uh, resources, I guess. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, to some extent, copyright is also an ethical stance, like, you know, these are fascists. Is this like, an, you know, or like, or like, you know, far right or whatever, how you, you, want, you want to define it. So that's a solution for, for the Fediverse, it seems, let's see. Although the Fed block, Fed block, you know, the, the federation of block lists is an interesting meta problem for federation, I guess, uh, right? Because it's sort of like the recursive problem. Um, but you know, for copyright, I could see that working the same. Is like if if people left, if groups left uh, each other alone and said like, yeah, you define copyright this way, you go ahead and do your business, and we define copyright like this, just leave us alone. Uh, that could be perhaps that could be an equilibrium, but uh, but nation states don't like that apparently. Mm -hmm. All this stuff is so tangly. Mm -hmm. um, I have an opportunity. This is a side note, but it's also maybe part of a check-in. Uh, in a week, next Tuesday, I'm doing a one-hour session for the MIM Business School in in Lviv, actually in Kiev, Ukraine, because I met the director of the business school when I gave my speech in Lat in Lithuania. Um, and so she invited me to give a talk. And the framing of the talk is basically rebuilding Ukraine. So any and all advice, suggestions on rebuilding Ukraine, I've got sort of my own ideas of what to put into the talk, but I would love if you have any thoughts on this, I will absorb them and remix them into a, a presentation. But I think it's a fun opportunity to, to put some ideas out that might be helpful. Uh, I'll drop a weird link, which is a Reddit, no stupid question, how to prepare your house for an active wartime. Oof. And it's from a Ukrainian like 10 months ago. Wow. But thinking through, I, I, I think, you know, like here's, here's the bottom. So let's work up from there or something. I don't know. The biggest thing really is to get U.S. Uh, economy on your side the way Japan did after. And that brings in a huge influx, which I think given their level of education and ability to work, 
you know, could catapult them at least for a decade. The problem then becomes mm -hmm. what do you do after you do really well after that first decade of material, because then Japan almost started to then overswamp us technology. And then there was a kickback for the next two decades as a result of that. So the question is how to do it. One of the big issues that Japan did in that post-war section is they had zero infrastructure. So they had no buy-in costs. So they were able to take massive chances on new developing technology, which they were able to license for really cheap. And that put them ahead for 50 years, in some sense, ahead of US economy. They were also given a leg up in lots of different ways. I know one little story from a story I heard at a retreat years ago where there were a bunch of photo geeks sharing stories. And at the end of World War II, like the Russians came in and basically took ev every machine that they could unscrew and take, they took off into uh, the Soviet Union to go build their own factories and do their own stuff. Um, but then when they got to the Zeiss uh, factories, um, uh, basically what happened was a lot of the plans and IP, uh, the Americans got to first, and they basically took that and gave it to Japan to start companies like Nikon. Uh, mm -hmm. and so the Japanese optics and camera industry come out of this seeding of German optics technology and IP. And then the Russians went to, I think, Czechoslovakia, and there's sort of, uh, there's a, a bunch of cameras like Zeiss Icon and a bunch of others that come out of. Uh, uh, out of the size kind of technology, but become uh, that becomes the hub of uh, Eastern Bloc camera technology. So there's a bunch of, of, of cameras from, you know, legacy from there that share the same genetic roots uh, with, with Japanese cameras. And the, the whole story is super interesting. It, it, it's similar to or parallel to uh, Werner von Braun and rockets and blah, blah, blah. I, I have a weird um, first first person uh, cultural account of of Japan and some aftermath of that, you know, fast rise and then you know trying to tamp tamp them back down. It's like don't get too successful. Um, uh, I worked in t telco uh, in the '80s, as Jerry well knows, um, and worked with some of the Japanese uh, telco companies. They had this really serious problem of learned helplessness around um, telecom. Uh, they, so I, and I don't know how this happened, but it would be interesting to kind of tease out the, the the historical background of it. But firsthand, what happened was that they had decided institutionally that AT and T, Mama AT and T knew best, um, and we're going to do anything that AT and T does, um, and that was their mantra for probably 20 or 30 years. So they hampered themselves in innovation. And I'm not sure if that was a reaction to being scolded by the U.S. or whatever. They, but they thought the U.S. was great and wonderful and knew all powerful and knew everything about about telecom. So the, the, the striking thing for me was this included the breakup of AT&T, which, you know, had good things and bad things. But they're like, the U.S. has broken up AT&T. We're going to break up our our telcos too, and they literally kind of like did the exact same thing that the U.S. did in a microcosm in Japan, making NTT East and West and whatever, and it was for no good reason except that they were copycatting the U.S. because the U.S. must know what is best for telecom. It was fascinating to watch, and I, I it was at the point where you could tell the U.S. telecom was when Jerry and I were doing this, you know, back in the 80s, early 90s, um, uh, we were super frustrated with the FCC and AT&T and things like that because it was just hidebound and could not move. And we saw all the cool innovations in spectrum and fiber and all that stuff. It was happening in third world countries where they had no no built infrastructure and no, you know, undo the cost basis. So it was it was you know, I, I, so I would tell these uh, Japanese telephone companies, America is not the best example for, for technology in this in this uh, area. You should invent your own stuff and just go fast, go, you know, go hard. That's a fascinating story, given what happened in automobiles. <clears throat> yeah, right. Exactly. Because because yeah. Demings went to the American automakers and they just like, you're an idiot. Don't talk to us. Yeah. 
he goes to Japan and like, oh my God, you're a genius. Let's do everything you're saying. And they like practically destroy the American auto industry, right? So just across the hall or just across the, the country, uh, they did this well. Interesting. Who was that? Uh, Japanese uh, Demings. Uh, w. Edwards Deming. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, Deming. He and uh, J. M. Duran were two. Deming was more in the statistics space and quality control. Mm, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and J. M. Duran kind of followed him up as a managerial. And those two still to this day are, you know, probably more influential in business and industry than even, you know, Taylorism in the early 1900s. And, and so it's not, where... you know, not all that stuff now goes by buzzwords like Six Sigma, right. you know, started with that. So, uh, and uh, the Toyota production system, yeah, which is kind of a grandfather of Agile in a way. Although when you have big disruptions in world supply chains, just in time, may not be quite the way to. Apparently, it's a it can, be be it can occasionally be a detriment. Yeah, you know. yeah. or any resiliency in some other manner built into those systems as a failsafe. I, you know, I, I feel I, I, I guess, and I don't know this at all, but I guess my my take on the American take on just in time um, production is that we cargo culted it from Toyota and whoever else without really understanding the, the cultural significance of it. So I think, you know, we were like, oh, just in time, it, that's, that's the headline. That's the thing that we want to grab. And there's a bunch of, a bunch of cultural and systemic stuff around that. The way Toyota interacted with its suppliers, for instance, is different than, you know, they had this really tight, um, socially bound link between uh, Toyota, the, the mothership, and all of its little suppliers. And so if you kind of lift just in time off of that and dump it in the US, you end up with this extremely fragile system because you haven't, you haven't, like, you just cargo call it. You didn't capture the whole, you know, essence of, of the larger system. There's a couple other bits of interesting history that I think we've even touched on in a previous um, fellowship call, uh, but there's a, a concept called Obeya, which is basically a war room where you put all your plans on the wall and really lends itself nicely to OGME kind of kind of uh, devices and all that, although it's meant mostly to be sort of paper, but you have your plans and your dependencies and everything in there. And then Obeya is a place to carry out BA, which is uh, basically a Japanese business culture thing that comes out of... Uh, uh, Kitaro Nishida, um, and uh, I'm going to shorten the story a lot. Uh, Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework is a competitive response to the idea of Ba, which was gaining a lot of traction. And the reason it's called Kinevin is that Snowden understood he needed some kind of local cultural reference, also like Ba, to make this other way of seeing things like stick and give it a, a place, right? So there's a whole bunch of really interesting history there as well. We had the I, I had the pleasure uh, when when I had my wiki company. We actually had some Toyota folks uh, over to our office. Um, so the context of it was we were an enterprise wiki company. So we got to hear kind of firsthand how an Abea works, and they were describing this uh, room with huge walls, you know, uh, twelve foot or or fifteen foot walls, and the whole thing was covered in paper. And so people would come in and you'd work on these big sheets of paper and they would like to, to make space, they wouldn't erase something. They would just put another layer of paper on. So they'd pull on another sheet, put a piece of paper on it. And so you had this ability to kind of peek under a couple layers and see the background of, of other stuff. And I was fascinated mm -hmm. and in love and That's all that cool. kind of stuff. That's really cool. Um, my understanding of uh, of um, how Japanese companies move proposals around is that they print the proposal out, and then the same proposal makes its way around. And when you agree with the proposal, you put your your chop. You basically uh, print you you stamp the proposal wherever everybody's signatures are. 
And the way you can tell how long a proposal has been circulating, how kind of old and tired it is, or how not successful it is, is how thumbed up the document itself is. And also when you stamp with your chop, the degree from vertical that your chop is, is the degree to which you disagree with the proposal, but by applying your, your stamp, you're agreeing to move ahead anyway. And that's the you know, Japanese consensus management process. Again, everything I just said needs to be fact-checked, but. I, that, that reminds me of, of Wikipedia and the different um, cultural ways Wikipedia gets used. So in Japan, again, to be fact-checked, um, in Japan, they they never create a page um, without a lot of background conversation about what the page should be. And um, a page is, it's, it's kind of like that, it, it sounds the same thing. You pass the page around conceptually and when everybody's like passed judgment on it and at least agreed to, to publish it, then you publish a, a finished page. American way to do it is you, you start a tiny little page with a bunch of junk on it and you just improve it. Um, and then I think the German way to do it is, is kind of in between those. Um, you, you have a, a more active background conversation, but you can start with, uh, you know, a draft um, and, and it's kind of like halfway between the American crazy way and the, the Japanese crazy way, I guess. There's, a, I heard a story, I think it's in uh, indigenous Malian culture. They start out in a group and one person starts with the idea and the next person repeats what they heard and maybe adds a little and then it goes around the circle and the idea slowly forms and morphs and goes from the most senior to the most junior and then it goes back up again at which point ideally the group has heard all of the opinions and can then make some kind of decision that's cool um but you know it takes a while but the idea is that you come up with a possibly better solution than just the the top of the company saying here's what we're going to do and elon musk said all the way to to nothing <laughs> would be really well, billy's, billy's got to go in 20 minutes i yeah. wonder if we should let him check in and billy didn't it wrote, wrote in the chat that he didn't have much of a check yeah out. i uh i offered to skip <laughs> um yeah i'm working on lots of things i'm not sure which of those fall into fellowship of the link um So, if yeah, you're, if you're right. trying to understand how Sauron is building like a, a horde to attack, that would be like relevant. <laughs> no, I, I understand exactly what Sauron's up to, so I don't okay. have to worry about that. Good. Um, uh, any any commentary on the election process? No, from the perspective of a. I don't think I could add any value to all the information out on the electoral process uh except none of it's logical or rational oh good uh, but i think everyone i think that's understood at this point um i guess the one thing is the uh you know i, I continue to to think about the list of thinking tools which i know pete you did uh, you had a meeting uh yep. to work on that and are working on another channel i'm feeling like i i might just let y'all steam ahead and then come in afterwards and figure out what canonical debate lab can use. Um, so if you would somehow, I guess I'm not sure where to keep an eye on that to know when it's, um, when I will keep uh, the fellowship of the link Mattermost channel, um, apprised of what's going on Great. right now. We're still kind of in brainstorming mode, three, three person brainstorming more or less. And when CDL did this, we had like 20 different, you know, categories so it'd be nice to see it you know your pared down list and then we can add yep. to it and but you're using Airtable in the background still at this point um we we uh we started using Airtable, and it's one of the tools where we're using you know kind of like we're using hackmd to brainstorm um uh so i guess the short answer is yes um, we had, I, I, I wrote in the notes that we're making slow, good, good, but slow progress. Um, uh, today we had a meeting, 
uh, we were we're we're half seated in the Massive Wiki infrastructure too. So math, this today was Massive Wiki Wednesday. We had we were talking all about the, the uh, tools for thought math. Um, we spent all all of our time basically talking about um, uh, user friendliness and power, um, and then. You know, is user friendly? Does that mean that it's easy to adopt? Does that mean that it's easy to use? Does that mean you know what's the learning curve look like on that? So we ended up kind of expanding into like three or four or five other dimensions, and then pairing it back down to uh, just like two again. Um, so we're kind of deep in the you know what are we what do we even talk what do we what do we mean by something like user friendliness or power? And we didn't, there's, you know, so there's another half dozen, dozen dimensions that we haven't even talked through at that level of depth. So. So yeah. do you think that that discussion means that the dimensions, uh, dimension, dimension lists must come with like thorough instructions to inter interpret in the end? Or does it mean that to some extent people will interpret it differently? So um, what? That's a great question. Thank you. And where where we ended up was that our our, our goal, I think, um, not that we really expressed it this way, but I, I think I have a sense of the three of us. Our goal is to make the dimensions useful and friendly and and easy to and easy and meaningful without a lot of discussion about, you know, why, why or what. Um so um I don't know. That's where we're going. I, I, I'm hesitant to share the. I I could totally share people into the air table, but I'm kind of hesitant to because without understanding more of the, of the context of why that particular column and you know it, it just uh, it's just a mess. But maybe I can share my screen um, and show you a little bit of the air table and where we are. Um, I see. I see. You're thinking. Is it the, is it the Japanese or the German way to uh, <laughs> to do their deal? It's a good question. Um, so I, that looks like a good share. Yep. So um, where we're at. Uh, so this. You know, even though Airtable is a database, uh, we're really using it as a thinking brainstorming tool. Um, so we started with. Uh, Matthew's axes here, um, and I've added a few. We ended up deciding that we wanted to keep track of who is the originator of of a particular one, and so I think um, uh, there's one of these where I've got. I I guess maybe I I didn't. I've I've added a few, um, but we wanted to be able to distinguish between um, uh, Matthew's. Um, definition and to score easily description of note making and say mine or mm -hmm. or bills. Um, let me make this big too. So, um, or you know maybe what I should do I could just well, it, I, I could share fine, a, a. We could Google promise link. we could promise not to mess with it. But <laughs> well, mm -hmm. it's like you know it's like we have these characteristics columns. Um, uh, so a lot of and and this isn't all the characteristics we might have, but without understanding why there's Bills and Matthews and Pete's, you know, it's like, what the heck are you guys doing? Some of this is just schema for the, the it it it's uh, scaffolding for talking about you know the dimensions and the schemas and all that kind of stuff. And so without okay, the background, so now you're two levels deep, right? Because you have you are, you have dimensions for the dimensions. Yes, yes, we have dimensions for dimensions. And then I think we we started doing this is something where I have multi select columns. And then this could have been so we, we, we started doing some scoring. Let's make a place where we could do scoring, awesome. not for the finished thing, but for you know how how useful is this score. And when I when I choose this score, you know, what does you know, how do I, so so here, this is a column, a classic column, uh, test, do not believe this score, um, because I was just using this score as a, you know, just a demo score, it's not necessarily real. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I guess where I was going with this is keeping track of this is this is a place, this is a good example, this characteristics things is a good example of where in Airtable I could have had another table called characteristics, and then each of those characteristics could have an owner and you know the value of it and whatever other metadata we want about the characteristics. But it was a place where it looked like it was probably easier not to have that overhead of the, the two tables, the interrelated tables. So we're just starting this way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure that we're really going to use this. It's, it's a sketch, you know, a sketch mm -hmm. for, yeah, this is a thing that we could do as we... Uh, yeah. so, so it, it denormalize. Makes sense. Yes. So separately, um, we started wanting to do commas, and I'm like, well, actually, so that this is a good place where um, uh, I think both of these are fake comments too. Um, uh, but this is a link to the comments table, and then the comments table uh, we're using the kind of the the, the name value in Airtable. Uh, as a summary, and then you know we can have expanded comments, and so this can be a place where we can have a co essentially comment threads on dimensions, um, uh, and it's clunky, you know, to do that, but it also gives us a lot of fine grain ability to to do that if we need to. So I don't Pete, know. Can I, well. Yeah, um, take a step back, and y'all may not have discussed this yet, but is your I'd be interested to know what you think, but for like the, this is all figuring out, you know, what the um, dimensions will be and everything. But yep. uh, as far as the like later kind of architecture of storing this data, yep. I know, you know, Massey Wiki's Markdown and stuff like that. Are y'all still thinking about having a backend database of the tools and the dimensions, or is it all going to be stored in Markdown files? Um, it's a good question, or and, that not and been decided. let me. Uh, um, uh, I, I think the answer is it's not been decided. Um, so this is uh, Matthew's draft uh, outline of the the project. Um, so we're we're kind of here, you know, just just set up something, anything, kind of, um, and then. And then we bring it to uh, Fellowship Link and OGM and, and start talking about you know this thing that we ran up the flagpole. Um, so the the so we're not you know we're we're still brainstorming. This uh, version one is brainstorming. It's not really launch or so. I think in this you know the this is the phase where we would really talk about storing it as a database. Um, I can tell you as the where we got to so far. Um, let me see if I can. Um, uh, looking for one particular, I guess the dimension scheme is something like that. Um, uh, where we, where I got to, where we, where we got to, I guess in Massive Wiki, this isn't a good example of it. But um, where we got to was we could have a massive. Maybe I should back up. It's really clear that that um, there's going to be a, a, at least a JSON version of the the data. Okay. Um, uh, so whether that comes from JSON files uh, in the Massive Wiki or it is reverse um, generated off of massive wiki pages with a certain amount of structure in the in the wiki page, um, or if it comes out of an Airtable, I it doesn't matter too much. Um, okay, yeah, I, I think yeah. I, we'll have interchangeable data, mm -hmm. and I don't know which is the inputs and outputs. Uh, but that's that's cool. All... Yeah, that was the big concern was um, we'd like to steal the data and manhandle it. Um, yeah, well, and make really sure that was easy for me to. Yeah, it's gone with your work. Um, awesome, uh, and I hope people do that. I hope people, you know, write tools against it or whatever, and you know, convert it and whatever. So, um, one thing than me. Yeah. So, um, it, this is amazing. Thank you so much for all this work. I mean, it's <laughs> on different on different levels and layers. Um, it, I guess from the other side, if you think about like uh, you know the end result, which is we have these dimensions applied to many tools. 
Yep. That's a sort of like uh, forces like a meeting point with this other thread, I guess, which is like get a list of all the thinking tools that are going to be evaluated. And we started at that earlier, but I don't know if we are also working that in parallel, there will be value and also advancing that. How do you see that? Uh, that's a good question. And I haven't really thought about it at all. Um, I, I know that for, for me, um, I don't even know. We haven't, you know, we haven't started even talking about what tools. Um, and Matthew, when he did score, he just used Obsidian. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so perhaps one, if you want like uh, to, I don't know if you can share access to this, but we call a way of like um, contributing uh, some of us without like, you know, adding too many cooks to the dimensions, the, the dimension dimension. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would be to like just work on that list. I don't know if it helps, if it, you know. Um, I, I think I would wait. Um, yeah, makes sense. And one of the, one of the caution things I have, um, maybe I can do this while I'm still uh, sharing. Um, hmm. Wiki software. Um, I think. I, I knew this, you know, I'm, uh, Wikipedia, I'm sure, has a bunch of these. But mm -hmm. uh, this, and I don't know how good this is. I haven't visited this for a long time. Um, but, you know, back five, 10 years ago, something like that, um, a, a list like this, um, and, and Wikipedia is especially in danger of this problem, is they get to be comprehensive and kind of meaningless, you know? Um, so making sure that you mention all the particular wikis that you can, this one, it looks like there's not very many. I would, I, I, I kind of remember this used to seem like it was a hundred or 200 or, you know, something like that at some point, you know, including old software that doesn't exist anymore, or it's really useful for three people in the world or whatever. And then you, you kind of accrete, um, odd things, odd metadata that's either, easy to track or easy to sort or something like that that's kind of meaningless you know um this one doesn't look too bad anymore so maybe this isn't the best example of a terrible um collection of so software that, but I've, I've seen it happen and that's not what i want so it could be that this one's been curated by hand and that's why it's looking tidier than before it, it looks a lot tidier yeah. but it could also be that it just needs some major filters at, at the top it's sort of like bentley did when he added filters to the spreadsheet that we were starting with for the radar diagram and the major sort could be hey show me only current active major projects and then yeah. and then if you say show me everything it'll show you variants and sub variants and wouldn't it be cool if actually it had a tree view where you could see that tiddly spawn of you know, basically a biblical a biblical tree view where you can see that that so and so begat so and so begat so and so, which is a, a view I've wanted for many different things. Uh, and then my question also to you and, and the, the conversation was, um, have you taken that one extra step from the obsidian with the mocked up numbers to trying to do the radar diagram, uh, the radar plot of it uh, uh, yeah. to see? Okay. Um, I'm I'm interested to do that, but I'm. Uh, and I, I've looked up some uh, sp spider graph libraries, actually. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm behind on <laughs> just. Yeah. Um, but it's not a high it, risk. I, I'm pretty yeah, sure yeah. we'll be able to figure something out. Oh, that's absolutely. A good, a good I'm, say it, yeah. I'm just like, it's like that's the one step after that, that will illustrate to anybody, any stranger coming in, why this matters and what, you know, what, what to do about it. Cool. Um, um, thanks, Bentley. Thank you, Andy. So let me do a commenter link to this table. Sounds great. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to share it because I, I kind of need to anybody who has this link, it's like, don't even like look at this <laughs> because it's just a mess of us playing with, you know, playing with a, a thinking tool to see where we get to. And a lot of it is useless. Um, so, uh, so I share this with, uh, with that caveat, um, if, if only we had better thinking tools to think communally this way, Good <laughs> Lord, I know. Problem, no? yeah. <clears throat> um, so I will put it for now, at least, um, 
or I put it on line 54 is where I'm putting it right now. Oh, in the, in, in the, uh, yeah, in the uh, hedge in doc. Hedge doc. Um, I can. Uh, X. Uh, no, I totally lost it. So I was also thinking perhaps of the, uh, you know, the question of the better thinking tools of even if you go to Obsidian or we, uh, once we go to Maradon, I guess it's going to be nice. I think once we have the, like an, an initial, I, I honestly, those I mentioned, I'm going to just say what I think. Uh, this goes to most things I say, by the way, but here goes. Those I mentioned look fine to me. Like I think for bootstrapping, I would be happy to like, this is how what, what I will do it is the American way, perhaps. Yeah. It's like dump them in like a page in the Agora called Dimensions. Yep. And each one of one each one of these has a weekly link. And then in an Agora of you know, meaning or once a week, you know, like a yep. thinking space together. And then we can write articles, essays if you want, on dimension yep. user friendliness. Yep. And I honestly just a, a, a dump of like our thoughts and the thoughts of our friends on what user friendliness means, I think that will be an interesting artifact regardless, right? I agree. Yeah. Um, the, the, the trick is um, uh, there's, you know, there's 10, like 12 or 15 uh, dimensions right now. So you could end up, essentially, I, bike shedding is what, what occurs to me. Um, you could end up in a large conversation about, you know, so, so at least with the three of us, uh, you know, we can say, okay, we've discussed, you know, we've discussed this enough. We don't mm -hmm. have to, mm -hmm. I don't know. And partly the reason I'm interested in we're, in going to the radar diagram is that once we start playing with the radar diagrams and having those conversations, that will, that ought to inform the dimensions a lot. Yeah. I like how we're like like kids uh, looking at the toys and seeing like oh just give me the toy. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, but uh, you know uh, yes I agree. But like also like um, uh, I'm I'm happy to wait for. I think it makes sense to have this uh, uh, like smaller group like what's actually putting also the time because I don't know anything. Uh, just like be more confident and consistent within the group, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Matthew said another good thing about, you know, it, it would be lovely to have an anagora of just user friendliness or whatever, right? Yeah. But he's like, and we and we kind of ended up there. The, this be the three of us, we're going to do it asynchronously. We're going to write a paragraph or two for each of the dimensions. But he's like, the thing about that is what you write about something else, right? What you write about power interacts with how I feel about what you wrote about uh, user friendliness right mm -hmm. so you can't have a you can't have a discussion about one one dimension without having a discussion about how that interacts with all the other dimensions at the same time right if only everything so, weren't so deeply intertwingled <laughs> exactly. yeah yeah but you know like once you get to <laughs> you do like just now but once you get to the writing it's like well you would just call that out i guess you know like the, the linking between the dimensions as when you say oh this clearly interrelates with this other one that will be nice to see in the graph, precisely. Yeah. yeah. I so so it, it seems like a kind of a bounded problem for each of us to go away and write a couple of paragraphs, you know, 20, 20, 25 paragraphs, and then come back together next week, and you know, fight and and you know, uh, merge, you know, the, the conversation. So that seems like a tractable problem that a few of us could do. And just the more people, the more participants you get, the, the mm -hmm. less tractable. It, it yeah, yeah. I mean, by the way, uh, this is just to like, there's no way I will write, I will, I won't write 25. I will probably like, write four and then get distracted. But the, the four, the, the, the four that each person chooses probably is like another data point. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's really true. That's yeah, a good anyway. thing. Yeah. Um, and and there's something about that conversation that that Pete that you three are laying the groundwork for, where I, I, I sort of look forward to recording that process and conversation, and then sort of sitting and thinking through it because. It's, it's a meta conversation about the space and about the tools and about how they interact and about how we assess that and present it in a way for other people to have an easier time finding their way to the right tools, for example, or uh, the meta, meta, meta thing uh, in order to make it easier for newbies to come in and assemble a tool suite that interoperates properly, that solves their particular version of the problem in a way that's suitable for them, yes. kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. Like find uh, uncharted territory. Yeah. Find like open space, no? Yeah. Yeah. Those are nice builder uh, problems. I, I I just went immediately. I guess to the same. We have had similar conversations about like the charting of the failures, no? And going back to the initial, you know, we started with the with the failure situation. And you know, I'm thinking to 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 a large extent, uh, these problems are very similar, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's like uh, charting the space, charting. Tools in the case of favors, people are mostly focused on the math on an instance, but that's sort of like also closing into a particular like uh, dimension already. Uh, so this is again shows why it's so important to start with the, this dimensional discussion. Uh, but I wonder if there there could be some re, like a reuse of what we are doing here for this for that problem or the other way around because I know already there are several sites that are like. Oh, this is helps you choose your instance, right? right? So right. you know, open source. Perhaps we can actually, if we want, we can have some something dynamic built on, on top of that. Just a thought. I like that. And Peter just asked in the chat: Is composability different from interoperability? And I don't know if anybody yeah. else has strong strong feelings. I, I have a, a an answer. So composability is internal to a system, and interoperability is intra system. Mm -hmm. Huh, but what if we start to say that um, composability across parts of the system is that does the system boundary just grow? Yeah. Okay, so so the definition of the system changes and things are composable as long as they're inside the system. And when you solve the interoperability problem with new external parts, then you've grown the system. Yeah. Okay, cool. And interoperability is kind of the practical nuts and boltsy part of the whole question. Which is okay, great. So, how do we interoperate? Is it APIs, standards, protocols, or something else? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Because I'm I'm not that familiar with the word composable. I'm just deeply attracted to it. It's uh, it's super useful, super powerful, and we and you hit exactly a really interesting place there because, um, it I I feel like we haven't done a good job of 